Hello and welcome back to the review of Dragon's Dogma 2. My name is Iken and today we're going to review the freshly released Capcom game, which is the follow-up of Dragon's Dogma 1. I will go through the game. I have played around 25-30 hours of it uh, by the time of this review to give you a fair assessment of the game. Before we jump into it though, I shall give a word of advice with my reviews as I am differentiating myself from most of the other game reviewers. I do not think that every game deserves a 7, 8, 9 or 10 out of 10. Quite the contrary, I'm more old school in that nature. I think that uh, games are uh, normally distributed as such. A game that has a 5 or 6 out of 10 is an okay game. A 7 out of 10 is a good game. An 8 out of 10 is a great game. A 9 out of 10 is a game of the year type of game. And a 10 out of 10 is a truly genre defining game. An absolute jewel. But the high ratings therefore will be an exception and not uh, the rule. So in case you don't like strict reviews, you might not want to continue. But in case you want kind of an honest view on the game in a concise fashion, this might be just for you. So let's jump into Dragon's Dogma 2. Before we're jumping into the actual game review, let's take a look at uh, what Dragon's Dogma 2 is. It is Fextra Live's uh, successor of uh, the very successful Dragon's Dogma 1. The publisher is Capcom, so powerhouses of the AAA genre came together and created an open world-ish RPG. I'm saying open world-ish because that's an overused term. It is actually a map uh, with a pretty decent size that you can explore and quest in. It's a single player game with the idea of you being uh, the Awaken, the true ruler of the kingdom. And as such, you do have pawns that you can call to your side. It is a single player game in a way that your pawn, which is uh, kind of your squire, can be recruited by other players as well. And then you get a little bonus. So that's the only multiplayer-esque uh, part of it. Other than that, the game features a wide variety of classes uh, that you can all um, unlock and play through. And you're essentially doing quests as you are ascending even further and uncovering a plot behind your amnesia. I won't spoil more of the plot, but that is the lay of the land. So how well is Dragon Dogmas 2 going to fare in that regard? Let's start with our first category, which is lore and background. This category is important uh, for those who like a consistent and coherent world. Dragon's Dogma 2 is doing a good but not amazing job in describing and portraying its world. When it comes to the pacing of the game, the game is not overloading you with information, which is great. The game at the very beginning does have a rich and broad variety of cutscenes just to reel in and hook in the player in the first kind of one and a half hours of the game. However, that slowly declines over time. Uh, I found that some of the dialogues were a little bit too long and too less on point compared to other games. Uh, a game that, for instance, has a very crisp dialogue would be Alien's Descent, where in every single dialogue you learn something more about uh, the storyline uh, that is unfolding. Another good example would be Banisher's Ghost of New Eden, which I recently reviewed. Both of the games are doing a better job in the pacing of the storyline. In terms of world building, um, the Dragon's Dogma world is rich and vast. However, the game, I think, undersells its uh, width of the world a little bit. And what I mean with that is you're running into NPCs, but uh, you very soon notice that there are a couple of patterns. Many of the NPCs are bystanders and don't really have a deep story to tell. So if you expect Skyrim level of uh, story depth where you are um, getting into Felgrim and you just have 15 quests that are all engaging and interesting, Interesting with richly detailed NPCs, you are not going to find that level of detail here from an RP standpoint. And it's not to say that the game is bad in this part, I just think if you are looking for a truly detailed IP uh, that does a wonderful job in telling a story, 
Akin, the Witcher 3 storyline, then this game here is not on top of the same level and quality of story. However, it does have its bright moments, specifically the main storyline is very well done. The storytelling sometimes suffers a bit from gamifications, but other than that, I would say a good attempt. Which brings us to the second category, graphics and graphical user interface. So the graphics are one of the shining aspects of the game, and I would say they are definitely absolutely modern. Deep character customization, very good textures, a rich environment, great env uh, environmental effects, and just overall very, very fluid animations. You can see that this AAA title of Extra Life has really earned its uh, worth by having such amazing graphics. However, that being said, the reason why I'm combining graphics and graphical user interfaces because I always want to make sure that the user experience of playing the game is not only polished by the looks of it, but you also have a great experience when steering the game. And this is where the game becomes a tale of two coins or two sides of a coin. Whilst the graphic is absolutely amazing, the graphical user interface leaves desired room for improvement. The game comes as a multi-platform release for both PC and all of the larger platforms. And as such, it needed to make compromises. However, there are a couple of compromises that I personally uh, feel were gone way too far above and beyond of what needs to be done as a compromise. Clearly, the game is meant to be played at a controller. However, given that uh, the game is mainly played as a controller, the game forces you with your key bindings, for instance, to uh, follow the same logic in a controller. The controllers have these little shift buttons that allow you to essentially uh, create more buttons on the controller by clicking the shift button and then uh, doing a combination. Uh, the key keyboard does not have that limitation, but the game rigorously refuses to let you, for instance, bind uh, special attacks on simple keys. It always needs to be something complex like control um, or shift or alt, whatever you're using, plus another key. That uh, makes the whole steering unnecessarily clunky, and it would have been a minor uh, event to implement that as well. On top of that, the graphical user interface, such as uh, inventory management, is, uh, to say it lightly, um, improvable. Um, most of it is not easy. Um, it is very much uh, tailored to an experience on a console, and those who are not playing on a console will suffer uh, from it. The hotkey bindings of items, for instance, take much longer than it needs to do. Um, and I will give the game a little bit slack in this regard. I don't want to speak too negatively about it, but um, Skyrim in its current version with Sky UI, for instance, has shown 10 years ago how you can improve inventory management and make it compatible for multiple platforms at the same time. This game clearly hasn't learned from that and hence I'm a little bit more apprehensive to give it a great score. So overall the mixed score between graphic and the playability, the usability, is only quote unquote only an 8 out of 10. It's still a very good experience, but it is certainly not genre defining in what they have created. Which brings us to the next category, sounds and effects. And that is where Dragon's Dogma 2 is delivering. The game has a wide variety of fitting sounds and effects. It starts uh, from a fully voiced interaction. All of the NPCs have voice actors that were um, carefully chosen and that fit the environment very, very well. Um, additionally to that, the environmental sounds are really outstanding. When you're traveling through a forest, you hear kind of the lush environment, the uh, chirping of the birds. Um, in the night, you uh, hear uh, crickets. And whilst you're underground, you hear echoing uh, sounds, footsteps, and the battle sounds on top of that are fantastic. So it is a very immersive um, uh, experience for those of us who are fans of good sounds. Uh, this game certainly delivers a wide variety of good sound effects. Why, though, is it not a 10 out of 10 in terms of sounds? 
I think a couple of uh, topics for that. Whilst I was playing, a few of the sounds uh, sounded um, tinny for the lack of a better um, description. So almost as if there was a little bit of a distortion on there. It might have to do with the overall very process hungry environment of uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. There are latency spikes. And I could have put that under the graphics or under the sounds. Both of uh, the categories are impacted by it. It might only be a first day release issue, but it is something that you need to keep in mind when playing the game, even on modern PCs in the city and in certain environments, you're going to have uh, a little bit, little, a bit of loading time, actually. Other than that, the sounds and the environment are very... Uh, enthusiastically created and I would give it a great score however not a genre defining score for the reasons outlined which brings us to tactical combat or tactical gameplay an important part of all of uh, the games I will judge the entire gameplay under this one and it is potentially a little bit longer because there are many things to go through let's start with the positive ones uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 certainly delivers on the action in action RPG the combats are fast paced and uh, they do have a few new mechanics that I haven't seen in any other game such as collaborative uh, mm, moves where you can jump on the shield uh, of your uh, warrior for instance to then do a leap attack on top of an enemy climbing on top of enemies using multiple elements just to uh, slow the enemies in an overall great uh, environmental engine that allows you to very much use knockbacks to your advantage uh, knockbacks is a real thing the fluidity of the combat is also great as well as the uh, love for details different enemies do have different ways of fighting there's a lot of environmental uh, action happening and I can really not criticize any of that however there is a separate part uh, which I personally didn't enjoy and this is uh, where this review is going to be more opinion based than fact based so I will state very clearly that uh, there are potentially types of players that enjoy the type of combat experience that uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 is uh, giving you if you have played the first um, game then you will uh, very much be an enthusiast but for newcomers of uh, the game or for people that have played other um, action rpgs such as uh, the witcher skyrim or other first person uh, 3d action rpgs the combat uh, leaves room for improvement it feels quite clunky the different classes play differently but oftentimes they do not have a very detailed or deep strategic uh, uh, playstyle. What I mean with that is if you've ever played Skyrim uh, with expansions like Requiem um, or on harder uh, modes, you will notice that proper movement, really good positioning and movement are core and key features in order to be successful. Likewise with The Witcher 3 to use another example. In this game here everything feels a little bit more like you're playing on a huge field of ice, you're sliding uh, and you can not break or move fast enough. Even the fastest class which uh, that I've played which is the Rogue uh, was having its fair share of problems with hitbox animations and just getting out of uh, the way. Now you can easily say that is a skill issue um, but uh, there are many classes such as the archer or the mage that simply uh, have the quote-unquote skill in just positioning themselves in the right uh, moment and then using auto aim in order to um, unleash volleys and volleys of arrows. I personally am not the biggest fan of um, auto aim and I guess my point here is my uh, personal criticism for the gameplay is it is very simplistic and the games are uh, the gameplay uh, loop is quite easy once you have understood it. Good. Now to the other gameplay relevant um, portions that I would say the game itself uh, comes with a lot of um, support. I can see that many of uh, the bugs in day one have already been fixed. That is great. I need to um, 
uh, congratulate Fextra Life for that. The game itself is in a relatively speaking for a fresh release, a bug free state, so that for gameplay is also good. The last negative aspect, however, of the game is that uh, for a single game, it comes with microtransactions. Um, the game makes, for instance, fast travel quite uh, tedious and time consuming, but then allows the player with real money to buy items that allow you to travel faster or level faster. Um, I have already little sympathy for microtransactions as it stands, but I have even less sympathy for it in a single player game. Um, on top of which, that uh, said game costs 60 plus dollars on release. So I really cannot understand the, those gaming practices and therefore I need to deduct a couple of points. Now, uh, how would I score the tactical gameplay? For a Dragon's Dogma enthusiast, it's potentially delivering exactly what was expected. So potentially an 8 to 9 out of 10, uh, given the microtransactions and a bit of, the, um, a bit of uh, the problems specifically on the graphical department and the freezes that I mentioned earlier. For someone who is entering the season anew, I would highly recommend a better introduction into the series. Many of the core concepts simply assume that you have uh, played Dragon's Dogma 1, which I did not. So for me, uh, the uh, vocation uh, types, as well as changing them, the different uh, features, uh, the vocation merchant, and all of that was relatively new. And even though there were short explanations to it, it was not very beginner friendly. Secondly, for someone who's not a Dragon's Dogma combat enthusiast, I will give a fair word of advice and warning. The combat in Dragon's Dogma 2 is kind of a binary thing. You either love it or hate it. I personally uh, did not like uh, the gameplay with the ranged classes at all. It felt like I'm just clicking two buttons. And if those two buttons, uh, combined with what I said earlier, are not even the buttons that I am deciding, but uh, the multi-platform release forces me to use strange combinations like Control T, Control F, and so on. Then the whole uh, experience is deteriorating a little bit. All right, moving on to the next part. Let's talk about replayability. Replayability is always or long-term incentive to play the game. You could call that category as well. Replayability is always a double-edged sword in single-player games because you need to find a way to get motivated to replay it again. And I will be the first one uh, to admit that I cannot fully judge that category because the game has a new game plus mode and I do not want to spend 100 plus hours plus another 100 plus hours just to judge that part of replayability. But from what I can see at the moment, uh, there are limited uh, mm, choices that you do have in storyline and the new game plus modus allows for a different ending a different approach to the game so that is good i'll give the game a credit for it the game also does have a fair amount of randomness uh, such as random encounters in in uh, the world and sometimes a little bit of a different way of approaching quests now all of that is not too bad because it allows the player even on a new game plus to have fun with a different uh, loadout and maybe test a different class i think the true replayability in this game comes from the different classes you do have one character and you basically collect uh, equipment for that character and so-called uh, skills for the vocations aka the classes of this game as you are progressing through the different vocations you also get passive benefits that's kind of your reward for leveling up these classes and therefore you can build quite differentiated uh, characters actually that uh, leads to a rich uh, experience of the game in different roles and I can see that uh, this could be an appeal uh, for a certain demographic hardcore console players that just want to play a single uh, player game over and over I would say though that there are a couple of missed opportunities for replayability uh, the game has a ultra high focus on 
uh, just looks of the game and depth of uh, the um, environmental effects. Sometimes some of the NPCs are very, very detailed in their description. Some of the quests do have multiple ways of approaching them, which is, uh, which is fine. All of that is great. It uh, offers flexibility. But in terms of replayability, I would have really um, wished for a little bit more, uh, say, random generation. Skyrim, again, is a great example for that. The Witcher is also a reasonably good example for that. So in Skyrim, there are many randomly generated events in the world, even with a base version of Skyrim, and you can run into them, which then leads to a lot of uh, follow-up. You can basically run into the Skyrim world uh, for many, many, many hours uh, time and uh, adventure, without actually needing to follow a quest and typically random events or NPCs that are going to be there will even yield uh, re rewards um, or you will discover something. So that uh, randomness would have helped the game to make it a, a bit more exciting in uh, during the replay at least from from my perspective the second option that the game would have in order to improve replayability is simply not throwing too much at the player at, uh, at the same time i started with six classes uh, four base classes and two advanced classes. I know there are potentially even four or five more classes, but sometimes less is more so that you can actually in the later parts of the game specialize and look forward to it. Generally, the class progression uh, system for my personal taste could have been done um, better by using core archetypes and then uh, letting vocations specialize more into uh, into certain aspects as in you have the fighter and then you can either become a warrior or a better uh, or a true tank. Whilst that uh, goes against the design philosophy, it really leads to a question what is a better experience in replayability. I'm uh, thoroughly con uh, uh, convinced that if you are having a character class progression, uh, that that uh, is more natural than always changing your vocation uh, types. But again, those are preferences, and I don't want to cast judgment on it. Overall, the game does a good, okay job in doing replayability. It could have been a six or a seven, but I will say for the non-hardcore enthusiasts of Dragon Dogma on uh, the console, you will find the uh, gameplay to be potentially set satisfying in just one playthrough and never touch it again afterwards. Which nicely brings us to the last category. What is the total judgment on Dragon's Dogma 2? I would say Dragon's Dogma 2 is a good but not great game. It is on the upper epsilon of good though, so it is borderlining great. However, I will say that uh, this is potentially a split judgment as enthusiasts of this particular genre will potentially uh, get their needs fulfilled. And for them, I would uh, say, go ahead. You do have my buy recommendation as the game delivers exactly uh, what it was promising to do in the first place. For newcomers of the genre uh, that might have played a couple of other titles, I would say that the game leaves a, uh, leaves room for improvement. It is not uh, very beginner friendly to uh, start with and the combat is clunky. Those would be my main concerns. There are a couple of other um, aspects in the game that I thoroughly think uh, should not have been there, as in microtransactions, and then there is a lot in between uh, that really comes down to preference. The game does a good, great job even, to um, showcase a medieval high fantasy magical world. Um, it gives you a lot of agency as the protagonist and it delivers on absolute astonishing uh, combats against great foes. So if you are into that, Dragon's Dogma 2 is just the right game for you. Also, if you like um, a nice intriguing plot, um, as the main storyline, then Dragon's Dogma 2 is certainly delivering on that as well. Um, with a price tag of over $60 and uh, stiff competition in the AAA space for um, RPGs, I would say um, for those who are on the edge, you might want to wait until the game is in sale 
Now, it is still a great game, but if it competes uh, with the Dark Souls, the Skyrims, the Witchers of uh, this world, then um, it will have a tough time to stand on top of that hill and come out victorious. Hence, the overall score is great, but not exceptional and also, in my perspective, not Game of the Year material. I hope you enjoyed the review. Let me know what you think. Did I get it right? Which aspects did I miss? And are you going to play Dragon's Dogma 2? If you enjoyed uh, this review, feel free to leave a comment and a like down below. And as always, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.